I want to thank the, uh, the Milken Institute for having, having uh, Bill Gates on after us. Um, it's always tough on, uh, in, in late slots on, on the last day of, an, of any conference. So um, topic for today, longevity is opportunity. Uh, that phrase alone for some people seems oxymoronic. Um, we are going to prove that it is in fact true. Um, and with that, I just want to uh, introduce uh, the, the panelists. Um, starting to my left is uh, Dan Houston, who's president of Retirement Insurance and Financial Services at Principal Financial Group. Uh, immediately to my uh, left is Mike Hoden, the executive director of the Global Coalition on Aging. To my right, Paul Irving, who's president of the Milken Institute, and thanks for pulling this together, Paul. And uh, to his right is uh, Pincus, AKA Hasi Cohen, uh, who's the Dean of, at the University of Southern California, uh, Davis School of Gerontology. So for everybody who wants to, at some point you will have access to 107 slides. I just wanna say from the out outset, we're not going through them. Um, However, they will be uh, pulled up where, where it helps, and particularly here in the start, to just level set. And so, Hasi, could you just give us a, an intro to, you know, what are the numbers, how, how big an issue are, are we talking about when we talk about this demographic wave, um, and, and what are some of the changes that we're, we're really talking about? Absolutely, if I could have slide 100, um, <clears throat> you can see that through incredible advances in medical technology over the last century, life expectancy in the Western world has risen from about 50 in the beginning of the 20th century to nearly 80 uh, today. And in slide 101, you can see that the result of that, that individuals at retirement age, which were extremely rare uh, even when our parents retired, have reached the point that there's about 20 million people over 65 in the US alone today, and their numbers are gonna to rise to about 80 million uh, within 25 years. And those people over 85, which are very few today, are gonna to become a force of 20 million uh, by 2050. And in slide 102, I just wanna make the point that while we have continued to make advances in increasing life expectancy, shown in the blue bars on the left part uh, of the slide, what we call health span, or how long we stay healthy without any disease diagnosis, has been a far less successful endeavor. And this gap between lifespan and health span is a major challenge for people today. And you can see on the right that total healthcare expenditures uh, rise dramatically in people over 65. So part of the opportunity that we're gonna talk about today is how to transition from uh, spending a lot of money on healthcare to other constructive areas. So, so let's uh, just j jump in to, uh, to, to the opportunity. Mike, um, you're the executive director of the Global Coalition on Aging, and I just wanna share some of the companies that are uh, members of the coalition. Uh, and no particular alphabetical order. Uh, Aegon, Bayer, Bank of America, Lilly, Deloitte, Galderma, Home Instead Senior Care, Intel, Johnson & Johnson, Microsoft, Novartis, Nutrica, Pfizer, and Standard & Poor's. Uh, pretty interesting, um, a range of, of companies, not all just in, in life sciences. What, what are, why are they in this coalition? What, what, what are they seeing both from a, an opportunity standpoint commercially, but also just what are the big issues for them? So, so it's a good question, Jody, and uh, perhaps I can kind of shift our thinking a little from maybe explicitly what Pich has said uh, about longevity and to suggest to you that what these companies recognize is that this is perhaps less about people living longer and more about this utterly transformational population change that has as much to do with the low birth rates as it does with people living longer. To the point where in a planning horizon for a company, for a government, 2020, a little bit, little bit out there, but a planning horizon, there will be a billion over 60. And if you go to slide 
Uh, I think it's slide 87. Let's try that. Is it 87 or 86? Slide 87. So here's the point. It's a billion over 60, more over 60 than under 14. And over the next couple decades, you'll have 2 billion, and you'll have even fewer. And this is global. So the, the makeup of society is fundamentally shifted. We've never had this before in the history of the world. And the implications are, A, huge market opportunities, because if you used to focus on a younger or youth population, you've kind of missed something now. That's decreasing. The older population over 50 is increasing. Secondly, the implications for public policy are enormous. We simply cannot afford 20th century entitlements, as we call them in the United States, social welfare in Europe and elsewhere. The Japanese, which are sort of the canary in the mine shaft, will in a few years have 40% of their population over 60. That's true across Europe, and it's equally true in China, Turkey, Brazil, and Mexico over the next 10 to 15 years. So, so it's so, about a demographic shift. So typ typically, uh, using the canary in the coal mine, uh, great police song, by the way, uh, the canary in the coal mine uh, angle, um, you know, my view of Washington is that it's really a bunch of chicken littles, another bird of a feather. And, um, and, and for them, it, it's we can't afford all these old people. It's, you know, you know my soundbite is that it's only in Washington that addressing the unmet needs of 100 million people plus is called an, a, a financial burden and unaffordable cost. In the private sector, addressing the needs of 100 million people is called an opportunity. So what is the opportunity that the companies in, in your coalition are, see and would like to you know, make yeah. real? So two things. One is huge commercial opportunity. That's where the growth is. Oh, close to a half a billion uh, over the next decade or so that become a place that you can market to, whether your products are healthcare, financial services, technology, or consumer. Secondly, that the character of your workforce is going to shift and the needs for your work for workforce are going to shift. And so you have to start treating things differently. And so let's just uh, move to slide 94 because I want to show you something on the barrier side. You want to see a pandemic or an epidemic, and some of you went to the Alzheimer's session earlier today. Keep, keep building. This is what it looked like in 1900. Number of Alzheimer's prevalence around the world. 1950, keep going. 2000, keep going. 2050, that is a pandemic. So a lot of these companies are looking at it from a marketplace opportunity. They're also saying, what are the barriers that we need to overcome if we're going to make it? This is a, not just a health crisis. It's a fiscal nightmare. So, so Dan, let's, let's take a, a, a little deep, deep dive and give the sure. audience an idea of you know, one particular vertical, financial services. You're, you're, you're sitting in a, in a space where you actually have re the word retirement in, in, your, in your title, um, and, and yet the reality of retirement has fundamentally changed. You have this new life stage where in the 20th century, 30 years of life, to, to, to Hasi's point earlier, have been added to longevity, but it's not at the end. It's not 30 years of additional decline and decrepitude. It's 30 years in the middle. Right. And so the very character of, of retirement is changing. So what, what are some of the implications? How are you seeing the needs and the demand for services like those offered by, by principal? How, how's that changing your thinking? How's it changing the opportunity? Yeah, I'm sure. And it's a wonderful opportunity, frankly. You know, we've been in business for 134 years. And most people would categorize us as a financial services company. But yet we're in the longevity business. Everything we do. We've been, we're in life insurance, we're in the annuity business, we manage $450 billion around the world. All of it is retirement-related assets. If you're managing retirement-related assets, you're managing in accordance to those sorts of mandates. And it's, it's imperative that we understand what the use of those funds are going to be for. And so by its very nature, it's going to be focused on fixed income, it's going to be focused on real estate, it's going to be particular asset classes that can assure that the person, when they reach that period of time when they want to retire, that their financial future is not put in jeopardy. So in terms of the opportunities, one of the opportunities that, that was developed here within the last 30 years, if you think about it, is the 401k business. 
Part of that time, it was the defined benefit plan. And you've been hearing a lot of boo-hoos coming out of DC about the demise of the defined benefit business. Well, here's the stark reality. If you'd been in a defined benefit plan back in 1975, 90% of the American workers were covered. And everyone wants to celebrate that as having been a great accomplishment. Here's the, here's the facts. Only one in five of those that were in one of those defined benefit plans was ever eligible for a benefit when they retired at age 65. And those that did retire at age 65, their annual benefit was what? 400 bucks, $400, that was it. Add that to your social security. So the advent of, of the system, 401k as we know it today, voluntary system, employer-based, allowing people then to have the choice to save for retirement. Now it's not without its problems, and maybe I'll just go to slide 90 here and make a couple of points. One of the challenges we face today is we haven't saved enough. That blue bar there for that age 45 to 54, they've basically saved 50%, uh, have saved less than one-fifth of what they'll need uh, in retirement. But it's the bar over there on the far right that, that is, has me probably most concerned. The top, two, the top two, the green section there is related to nursing home coverage. Most people think Medicare and Medicaid take care of those things. The reality is Medicaid does, Medicare does not. And then you have this component around unreimbursed health care. You go back to 1975, that wasn't, that wasn't the challenge. You really just had to cover the yellow section of the bar. But look what's happened as a result of, of uh, health care related cost and longevity. We're living longer. So we'll talk more in today's panel about maybe some of the things you can do so one to of the remedy other, this. One of the other parts of this reality was that the assumption about savings for, uh, for retirement, however you want to define it, really was a three-legged stool. That's correct. Right. So you had your own personal savings. Right. You had Social Security, and you had a pension. Right. Now the pensions are gone. Personal savings have been whacked. The biggest asset class that people own homes has, have have lost you know uh, have lost value, and now we're, people are looking at at Social Security as 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 that single thing that saving saving grace and the average you know uh, take home on that is about fifteen thousand a year. I don't know how many people here can live on that. I can't, but um, so what's the reality of now getting people to prepare for this right. changed world? Well, one of the challenges we face is the longevity component, right? If before the race was to age 65, you died at 68, you didn't take a lot of planning, Social Security would allow you to finish, you know, limp over the finish line. Today, that isn't true. I mean, the reality is you're going to probably live as many years in retirement as you had for a working career, about 30 years if everything works out well. That's, that is the challenge. Social Security, I think, will be there. I think it's going to be subject to means testing. Defined benefit has to be replaced with defined contribution. There has to be more. And maybe I'll go to slide 91 to help make a point here. 91 would help us shape this. These are just small, little things that people can do. So from an employer's perspective, it's what we refer to as a plan design that allows you to stretch the match. you got to get to 8% deferral. A person today starting to save at age 30 has a normal retirement date of age 67. That's what it is, Social Security, you're eligible to retire at age 67. You'd have to save roughly 13 to 14% of your income from the time you turn 30 until the time you turn 67 in order to replace 85% of your income at, at retirement. And that's what we see on the other side, starting a person off at 7%, incre increasing that 1% per year for five years, get you to 13%, you can see it nearly adds another quarter of a million dollars. That's what we're gonna to have to do in American society in order to replace that part of the stool, that leg on the stool that previously was being provided. Kasi, I'm, gu I'm guessing you wanna jump in here on the healthcare costs. I, I think that another important variability component of this model is that nobody knows what their particular endpoint is going to be. Right. And you could live to be 98, you could live to be 67. And we are developing the technologies today through genomics and other predictive uh, models to help people identify what are going to be their healthcare needs, what are going to be their uh, uh, retirement costs, and people can plan this a little bit better based on family history, emerging genomic testing, and just pure uh, prediction models. But go, I, go ahead, Mike. I, I'm, I'm, I mean, what's the magic of 65? Uh, particularly when we're living to 80 or 90 or, or more. Sarah Harper, uh, head of the Institute on Aging at Oxford University, gave uh, the London Lecture last year. Now, A, the fact that the London-Oxford Lecture was dedicated to this topic was interesting. 
B, what she said, among the things, was that a young girl born in the mid-90s is likely to see three centuries, live most of her life during the 20th, and actually live into the 21st century. And as she said that, we knew she was more or less talking about London, New York, maybe LA, uh, you know. But in a few years, it's also Beijing, it's Sao Paulo, et cetera. That magic of 65, as many of you will know here, was invented by Otto von Bismarck in the 1880s, basically for a political reason, and he essentially said, I'll give you your benefits. You know, it's like if we picked 97 as the age that we're going to retire today. So 65 is a paradigm that was picked not even in the 20th century, and we're still living with it both from an individual point of view and a public policy point of view. So I would challenge that as a basic assumption. Paul, I, I, I want to turn to um, a, a little more focused, kind of take this and, and ask, well, so what? Right, so, so what, what's the, the, the opportunity? Just so people have some additional numbers, not only are there currently over 100 million people who are uh, over 50 in, in the country, but they actually spend the wee bit of $3.5 trillion every year. Um, just as a point of reference, gener Generation Y, where all the ad spending goes, also about 100 million people, and they spend about $800, billion, $800 million. So, uh, I take that back, 800 billion versus 3.5 trillion. So it's the only humongous growth market that exists. Um, the one question that you never want to get from your board of directors if you're in a company is why did you leave money on the table yeah. for ignoring a market of over 100 million people with 3.5 trillion dollars to spend? So you just wrote this, uh, you know, I thought was a great uh, uh, column in Forbes. And wh why don't you share with us just some of the insights around this? Sure, well, uh, look, we, we all have, by the way, how many, how many boomers in, in the room? Just out of curiosity, can I see hands? And, and, and how, many, how many have boomers in their family, the, re, the rest? So, <laughs> so there, there, are, there are times in history where we, where we realize that we've missed something really, really big. In 2006, we missed the, the incredible overpricing of real estate, and earlier on, we missed tulips. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and I remember somebody in a lab, a lab de working with DARPA to develop something called DARPAnet probably had no real recognition, it was about 30 years before the internet really took off, that, that there was going to be this huge explosion and, and huge change. So uh, it's actually remarkable. We, we have about 3,300 people or so who come to our global conference, and if people recognized what was going on in this discussion, every single person would be, would be in this room, and this would be the most important discussion we'd be having at, at the global conference, and, and why. Well, again, 78 million boomers in the United States, and Mike and others have talked about the, the, uh, the fact that Japan, Europe, and many other countries are, are, are massively ahead of us. So we're living a life that was designed in a different, in a different generation for metrics that were very different, the, the kinds of metrics that Hasi talked about originally. Um, let's look at this both from a personal perspective and a, and, a, and a business perspective. We're all about growth, we're all about innovation, and we're all about, uh, frankly, solving social problems. So there's no better place to, to talk about that than, than this. Um, uh, from, a, from a personal perspective, I can say, and I suspect I say on behalf of all, of all the boomers in, in the audience, we want and need new products and services. Uh, I want a car that's appropriate for me but I don't want an old man's car. Uh, my wife, I know, talks about uh, the fact that sometimes her shoes hurt her, but believe me, she doesn't want old women's shoes. Uh, there is a huge, a huge, huge opportunity for, for uh, product, de product developers, retailers, et cetera, whether it's in healthcare or financial services or consumer products or the entertainment business, et cetera, to take advantage of, of this audience. That serves our needs personally. From a societal perspective, growth comes at the, at the intersection, as I think we all know, for those of us who were in the India panel earlier, and, and, uh, and for those of us who look at GDP numbers in China, we kind of chuckle about the slowdown in China, still GDP growth at a rate that we can't even imagine in the, in the United States. Growth comes at the, at the, at the uh, convergence of the intersection of, de of demographic change and innovation. There is no better place in the world where we know that's happening than, than in the aging space. So I guess, Jody, to answer your question at kind of a macro level, we stand at this precipice. It's really already occurring. It's already upon us. 
what some call an age wave and others call a demographic shift and some call a silver tsunami of, 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 of desperate personal need mm -hmm. for, for change, for a ra new range of products and services, a huge business need. You and I talk regularly about the fact that we're ab absolutely shocked that more of our friends in the private equity business uh, who sit in our audiences don't have a private equity themed mm -hmm. uh, longe longevity focused fund. They, they should, somebody, somebody will, and they're gonna make a whole lot of money doing it. And, uh, and I think that's what we're all talking about up here on stage. You know, on the innovation uh, front, I just wanna give people a perspective. So AARP, uh, in, uh, my group, um, puts on a live pitch where we put startups in front of prospective investors, particularly in the health space. We have this event, it's called Health Innovation at 50 Plus Live Pitch. Between September and now, over 200 companies, 200 startups, all in the health innovation space, have vied to be one of 10 companies to go on stage. These are all companies that were created only in the last year, 18 months, and this is just in the health space. So there is innovation that, that's happening here, but the financial markets, the VCs, have to be aware of this potential deal flow and you know, to to, to uh, Hasi's points before, you know, healthcare is going to be a huge opportunity. I've never understood, you know, why why this country bemoans the fact that healthcare, you know, represents such a large percentage of GDP. But we but, we, we never bemoan the fact that agriculture accounted for a large share of GDP or manufacturing or anything like that. Why isn't it a strength that 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 can be leveraged and actually becomes the new DARPA? of you know, innovation with implications all over the place that we just haven't identified I, I just yet. have to interject and mention something about Hasi, which, uh, which I, always, I always find just, just an extraordinary statistic. So, so again, huge global implications. Really, I think people would say that the most important thing happening at a human level in the world is demographic change. And probably the most important thing happening in, in the physical world is, is climate change. Does anyone know how many schools of gerontology exist in the United States? Can, can we venture a guess from the audience? How many schools of gerontology exist? 10, 15, 20? The answer is one, and, and, he, and he runs it. So, well, but I'll I, give you another example yeah. of the, the, how the shifting paradigm uh, must uh, come forward. Uh, when you look at the US government, uh, there was one place in the US government which actually has the term aging attached to it, um, and it's aging and disabilities, and it's inside HHS. So again, it goes to this notion that there's a presumption that when you're over right. a certain age, you're automatically dependent and or disabled. And we know that that, A, does not have to be true in the 21st century. Uh, you know, God forbid it can happen to us when we're 23 or 93, but it's not automatically associated, particularly if we begin to get some of the innovation right around, around wellness, uh, around the kind of research and development that we're going to need, around a different kind of lifelong learning. If you would go to slide uh, 43, uh, one of our colleagues who couldn't make it, uh, Ken Dykewald, many of you know, uh, I think is genius at creating these sort of pictures. So He'll, he'll be really happy to yeah, get that. Yeah, he'll like that. <laughs> well, <laughs> among other things. So here's, here's a slide of what, what it looked like, uh, linear life plan. Go to the next one. So now we have this longevity bonus. And of course, as the longevity bonus kicks in for many of us who are already in 40s or 50s or 60s, there's only so much you can do, which is why I say this is about a fundamental shift of how we live our lives during the 21st century. So now go to the next one, and it shows you that that's not the way to think about it. And this final slide is how we have to begin to live our lives differently. And you know, it's partly for us, but it's partly for our children and our children's children because the 21st century will look different and it is a market opportunity inside there to Jody's basic question. Dan, um, Principal is known as, uh, as, as, a, as a company that um, is very focused on, on small, medium-sized businesses. Yep. 
And um, if you look at Kaufman uh, Foundation data, the fact is, is that people in their 50s and 60s start companies at almost twice the rate of, of people in their 20s. Some of these people are just have been lifelong small business folks and, and entrepreneurs. Others are finding this as an opportunity. In fact, half of the entrepreneurs in the last 10 years have been people over, you, you have the statistic in your, in your article, and I'm, yeah, and I'm forgetting. I, yeah. You should know this by memory. I should, Come on. I should. And, uh, but, but it's significant, significant it's, numbers. It's, it's in the range of half. Right, so, so how, how do companies like yours and, and the financial services industry kind of acknowledge this this evolution of right. where the growth is, where because banks aren't lending. So where, where do companies like yours kind of step into the breach? So yeah, just a few stats. If you, if you look at our block of business today, we have over 100,000 relationships with small to medium-sized businesses, not defined by less than 1,000, defined by less than 100. And if we look at the statistics and the, and the growth in, in businesses around the, around the U.S. today, two-thirds to 90% of the jobs are added where? It's not IBM, it's small to medium-sized business. So that's frankly one of the reasons why we like this particular market segment the most. You know, ironically enough, they do have access to capital, but the capital is usually coming from friends and families. That's how they're starting these small to medium-sized businesses. We're one of the title sponsors for the Inc. 500, 5,000 uh, conference each year. And you're in the room with you know, 5,000 entrepreneurs. What's different today? The amount of capital they need to get up and running is what? this big. That's right. It really is a very low capital intensive society that we live here. It's a lot of software, it's a lot of consulting, so much around healthcare. And I would, I would fair to say of the, of the Inc. Conference winners, and this, these are the fastest growing companies in the country, over 20% of them would somehow be tied to the healthcare industry. And if you just think about healthcare and being about 20% of our, of our total GDP, it seems and feels it about right. But one of the fastest areas of growth that we have in our company, and this ties back to the baby boomers, all right, you've been busting it for the last 50 years, the last 40 years, the last 30 years. You and your wife built a beautiful business, and neither your son or your daughter wants to run the business. But it generates four or five million dollars of, of revenues every year. Now what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. is, there, is there an IPO market for that? Probably not. But, but it, through an ESOP program, employee stock ownership program, it's become one of the predominant ways to move that ownership from that sole proprietor who had a son or daughter that didn't want to run that business, put it in the hands of the management team to go ahead and continue on. We're the largest administrator in the country of these ESOP solutions. Again, it's just one additional way to help provide the necessary capital for the baby boomers to go on and do the next thing they want to do in their lives and allow the management team to continue to go on. One stat I want to throw out to you. If you go back 25 years ago, the average age of retiree was 63. What is it today? 64. 55? Yeah, yeah, I wish. <laughs> uh, just short of 64 years. So in spite of you know, all the improvement in longevity, the retirement age has stayed about the same. It hasn't changed materially. So the question really becomes, in my view, what's your health like? And so we were talking about it earlier. So we own a wellness company. But the whole idea of this wellness is to put more onus, more pressure on workers, on individuals to be more accountable for their actions, to keep the weight off and do these sorts of things. If we went to slide 92, let's take a peek at 92 here, it might help us. You know, these wellness programs that are put in place today, you spend a dollar in a wellness program and through improved absenteeism and improved uh, results in your healthcare plan, you're getting about a $6 return for every dollar you're spending in the wellness area. This, this also goes hand in hand, I think, with high deductible healthcare plans. There should be something for catastrophic, catastrophic healthcare uh, issues. But as it relates to just maintaining good, healthy lifestyles, that we should own that. We should own that as individuals. The government shouldn't subsidize it. American employers shouldn't subsidize that. That should fall back on our shoulders. And again, it, it puts you in a position that when you get to be 57 or 63 or 65 or whatever the number is you want to retire, you have choices. You decide what you want to do in retirement, and you can take advantage of all those bands that showed in and out of the workforce, volunteer, leisure, whatever the case might be. But at least you have options at that point in time. So can I just jump in yeah, go ahead. Real, really quickly? So I, I want to just comment, uh, Dan, on the, on the, the, the modest shift in, in retirement age. So Encore.org. Did a, did a study not too long ago where, which, which uh, reflected the fact that about 9 million, 9 million workers in the U.S. are in so-called Encore careers. About 31 million, according to Encore, and growing very, very quickly, seek to have, have those kinds of careers. So 
how we define retirement, whether retirement is defined in the, in the same way, really has, has shifted. So is, is it departure from primary career, taking on something? Could be volunteership, but it very easily could be a, could be a, second, a second job. But this, Some, this speaks to, to, yeah. to, to a key um, uh, gap in, in terms of what people want to do and what circumstance forces them to do. In our uh, research, we, we hear that people don't want to, quote, retire until they're well into their 70s, however they define retirement. But to Dan's point, the reality is people still do it. And they do it either because they have to, they do it because of forced retirement, they do it because they've been laid off and there's a perception that they cost the company more, even though actually it's a pretty simplistic view of cost because they're usually looking at healthcare costs. Um, but the fact is that um, there's not the structure uh, in, in the system to take advantage of this new asset class of people that has never existed before on the face of the planet. Educated, trained, talented people with 30 more years of life who want to stay physically productive, intellectually productive, part of this plays into prevention and all sorts of other things. Why don't you run with that? So to go back to this issue of rising healthcare costs and wellness, if I can have slide 105. The big elephant in the room when we talk about healthcare costs in the next century is, no, uh, 105, please. Just two slides back. Uh, the big elephant in the room is Alzheimer's disease. Right. And the number of people who have Alzheimer's disease today is already in the 20% uh, the range for people over 70. And if you include mild cognitive impairment, or MCI, it goes to about two-thirds of people over 90. So th this is really what most of the healthcare costs are going to go into. And if you go to slide 107, which you just had before, this illustrates the economic value of prevention. We currently spend over $200 billion a year now just on dementia care, which is an enormous amount of money. And if nothing changes, we're going to spend a trillion dollars on dementia care in 30 years. And if we can just delay dementia by five years, now you can see the blue bars, we'd be able to reduce the cost by three-fourths uh, now and save close to half a trillion dollars a year through simple things like exercise, the right diet, and even if you can come up with a new medication that some drug company can make five or ten billion dollars a year on, that will just delay the progression from mild and cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's. You're talking about savings to society uh, of half a trillion dollars a year. So, and so I, go ahead. Uh, and I would just, uh, I'd, so I'll make the pitch that uh, obvi obviously Hasi Cure, and I know you would agree with this, is, is, is the ultimate goal. And certainly, if we can achieve a cure, that's something that we should all, all aspire to. But um, uh, some of the characteristics of delaying retirement, of continuing engagement, which we know have implications on, uh, for obesity, depression, a series of other, of other conditions, suggest to me that, that lengthening work lives, whether, the, whether that length is in primary careers or, or inventing this new era post-retirement, is not only an important thing for, for wealth and for, for stimulation, but it may also have very significant health implications. Is that right? Absolutely. People who remain intellectually active uh, mental exercise is just as important as physical exercise, and together they contribute to delaying and preventing Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, you know, one of the interesting things is amongst the, the, the 200 companies that uh, have applied for our event, there, there are, oh, probably 15 easy that are focused on wellness of, of in, yeah. in various ways. And it, with a target on the 50 plus uh, you know, uh, uh, population, um, but we also had a winner of, of, one, of our, um, uh, one of our scholarships at a, at a, a technology launch pad called Demo, and it's a company called Neuropath that used IP from uh, the neuroscience department at Emory, and they claim, and the numbers show, that to a level of about 90%, they can uh, diagnose um, Alzheimer's in pre-symptomatic people. And nobody knows what the implications are for 
treatments starting with pre-symptom, pre-symptomatic people, yeah. as opposed to once symptoms show, because at that point the brain is that much more compromised. So there, there is a lot of really interesting activity that, that's going on here, and to the point of, of this conference, some people are gonna make some serious change. So there are three points I would suggest out of this part of the discussion, which I think is very interesting. One is that we have to change our paradigm and think of 50 to 90 as a demographic cohort who actually can remain active and economic contributors. Not everyone will, not everyone will want to, not everyone can, but... So you mean next year I have to give it up? <laughs> some percentage will, will be there, and I gotta tell you that when you look around the globe, that's the way our competitor nations are looking at it. I was sitting around a table uh, with the Asia Pacific Economic Council, uh, which are the 21 member economies that are either in Asia or touching the Pacific, which of course includes America, we know here. Uh, the country that was the most aggressive was Vietnam. And because they looked at where Japan was and they said, no, we gotta do things differently. Second point is that we have to start thinking about spending differently in our public spend on wellness, as you were saying. And the third is on, on the research that will give us the answers later. So, you know, I was just with some Chinese officials and they have understood that a large part of their problem uh, as people age are, you know, the, the falls and, and the impact that that has and a lot of that comes from vision deterioration. So they've made a judgment that 66% of their analysis of the vision problems that results in falls, which results in all these bad things, are with cataracts. They are now implementing a program where they're doing surgery on two million people a year in order to correct cataracts. So what's, what is our answer to that? And you know, we have to start looking at what we're gonna spend on Alzheimer's, for example, and we're gonna spend on, on other kinds of things. Uh, and other countries are doing it, and we have to be smarter about it. You know, one so, of the, one so, of the most so, so just an, an, an idea that, that, that I'll throw out is uh, one, of the, one of the implications of Alzheimer's we know, when, when, we, when we do analysis of the cost of disease, one of my complaints is we, we typically focus on, on medical cost. It's, it's obviously, it's the most central issue, but it's certainly not the only issue. So the other thing that we deal with is huge loss of productivity cost for, yeah. for caregivers. By the way, a particular problem for women. So, so Alzheimer's, in many respects, is the, is the new women's d disease. It is, it is in, in many respects, the ne next pink women, ribbon disease, not only because more women, women are affected by Alzheimer's, but because about two-thirds of caregivers are, are women, repressing opportunities to advance in the, in the workplace, uh, uh, restraining uh, in income-generating capacity, et cetera. Incredible stress. Uh, incredible stress. And, and so, so we have now this kind of aging cohort looking for new things to do. What, Hasi, if, if we could figure out a way to retrain and redeploy our aging workforce to become caregivers and to enable maybe, in a sense, younger women to be able to continue to have careers and build. So, you know, I, I think that the one additional aspect we haven't really touched on, which is an economic opportunity, is housing and care for various stages of disabilities, which are inevitable. And even if people take really good care of themselves, everybody reaches that point where they need care. And especially in countries like China, the incredible exponential growth in this need is going to be the most powerful economic force in years to come. So both building the communities where people will live with the appropriate gradation of care and creating the right uh, labor force to deal with that and training it uh, is gonna be an economic opportunity. And I think that what people complain about when they say, oh, medical costs are rising, is the concept that 80% of healthcare dollars go into people in the last year right. of their life. And about half of that, the last month of their life. I'm glad, I'm glad we need you to used... shift, to shift the investment of healthcare earlier on to prolong life, to prolong healthy life. I'm, I'm glad you used the, the, the word exponential. I was, I was at a, a conference last week on what's known as the sharing economy, collaborative consumption and the mesh. And uh, a, a quote that was used there was, uh, you can't solve an exponential problem with a linear solution. And so just on the issue of, of caregiving, 
Um, our Public Policy Institute calculates that the unpaid value of caregiving in this country is $450 billion per year. Well, that doesn't get you know, added to GDP, right? So there has to be a way to, to monetize that, to give people uh, the opportunity to actually be recognized from the point of view of being paid. There's a, uh, a young company in, in the Boston area called SeniorLink that has started, a uh, venture back company, started uh, paying family caregivers for the unpaid, previously unpaid care that they provide. And what's happened? Um, better caregiving. People now feel valued. It's not like they're making a lot of money. I mean, what they're being paid is the standard low income pay of caregivers, but they're getting paid now, whereas before they weren't. Better health outcomes, because the caregiving is better. And on top of that, and this is for Medicaid, the Medicaid system in, in uh, Massachusetts is saving money as a result. So when you think about changing the paradigm, here's one where you pay people and the system saves money. Right. And the opportunities for things like that it seems to me is where the thinking better delivery, has to better go. care, less public expense, one new point. new business creation opportunity. Right. So you know, so the health insurers now have to change their business. Right. Before they got paid because they do lots of things. Now the only way they're going to make money is to keep people out of the hospital and well. So they become an ally in all of this in a way that I don't think in in the past you you wouldn't look to them. And so in this era of fiscal you know, uh, nothingness, <laughs> awesome. where, where there's not going to be federal funding coming, it has to be the private sector that, that, that steps up. Yeah, it, and, no. uh, well, and, and just to go back and, and really, I would hammer this point about the Alzheimer's piece, which really is the one that is going to be our nightmare for the 21st century. Put, put up slide, put it back up, slide 97. Uh, 94, 97. Um, you know, th this, this is a global epidemic. And when you look at the amount that we're spending on research, it's almost unethical. And it's not just the United States, it's global. We're beginning to see some change. Uh, some of you may know there's a new organization that was created uh, CEO in initiative, and it's again, to Jody's earlier point, there are a number of companies at the CEO level who, have, who are not in the business of providing medicines or healthcare. You understand where the Pfizer or the Merck by, might be interested in joining CEO, I. Uh, you may not understand why other consumer financial service, but it's because all of them are looking at this as a huge cost, and one of those barriers, if not the barrier, to turning 60 to 90 year olds into an economic growth opportunity. It will, and frankly, this is the issue that's hitting the workplace as well, right? Mm -hmm. How many of those people in this room, I suspect, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a minority, obviously, but are, are having to take care of their parents for a variety of different reasons. You know, this isn't truly the sandwich generation. You got some kids moving back into the house, couldn't complete college or whatever disruption they had in their lives. Parents need the additional help and it puts enormous pressure. It's, it's the first time we've ever had four generations in the workforce at one time. And this, so what are, what are, just, just if I could finish just for a second, one of the programs we actually put in place to recognize that people, sometimes FMLA isn't enough to get people through a, a situation with their families. We have a program called Happy Returns. And I got to tell you, the other day, uh, there was one woman by the name of Rose O'Brien. I've known her for 25 years. I'm the one that gave her the nice gold watch when she retired. And she said to me at that time, she and her husband were going to travel. She had been waiting all of her career to retire. This was it. This was the big moment. They were going to retire, buy the motor home, and do the thing. Nine months later, I'm walking through the cafeteria. Back There's Rose O'Brien. I said, Rose, I thought you retired. She says, I was tired of that already. She says, I'm back. <laughs> Happy returns, Dan. Right. And, you know, it, it's neat that there are programs now that a lot of employers have adopted to recognize that these decisions aren't final. She's not doing the same job that she did. She's not having to work 40 hours a week. She's got way more flexibility. But the point is, she wasn't getting the fulfillment that she needed at that point of her life. The other example would be if someone needed to step out and take care of a parent, 
that same program is, is there for them to come back in some capacity from the organization. So here, so here you have a company that is, it can recognize and can welcome her back. Has to be. And, and so, you know, with all the wisdom, all the institutional knowledge that she has is still now at the benefit of, oh. of, of, of principle. You know, it, it, Jody, can I speak, yeah, sure. can make a, a point on this? So, so in, in response to this, so uh, oftentimes when I talk on this subject, one of the responses is, well, gee, we have kids in, who are millennials, and and many of those many of those kids are, are having trouble finding jobs. Very very tough in that generation. So um, after after the Marigold Hotel came out, which was of course a huge success, way outstripped any expectations about what it was going to do. Participant Media and Encore.org did a did a study because what they wanted to understand, if you recall some of that picture was really about intergenerational men mentorship. You remember the kind of Judy Dench character who ends up mentoring these, these young people in India in their, in their, mo in their phone uh, oh, their call response, center. their call center, their, their response operation. And so, and what they found in this, in this study, which really belies this kind of intergenerational tension was that about 70% of, of boomers who, by the way, do want to continue to, to work, are prepared to make financial sacrifices yep. in, in their jobs and in their lives to mentor and, and provide opportunity for people in the generation down. So, th so this, this bill of goods that, frankly, we've been sold, that it's this attention and it's kind of a Washington-driven discussion, right? It has to do with the entitlement challenge, that it's kind of us versus them in reality does not reflect the view of, of most people who want to see young people succeed or prepared to make sacrifice but want to remain remain engaged themselves as, as mentors and advisors. Well, another another side of that is 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 the fact that um, you know people are, are just going to be facing an employment shortage. So the demographics here, you know, presents another challenge. So it's very few companies that have actually prepared for this. So there is an example of and and Mike you would know more about this. Uh, there is an example where BMW did what Germany is facing an even more challenging demographic wave than, than we are. And BMW did not want to lose its experienced workers at the same time, it's manual labor. They also didn't want to have a reduction in productivity. So what they did was they created an assembly line. They populated it with what they forecast would be the age distribution looking five years out of, of workers. Then they went to the workers and they said, what could we do that would improve productivity? They, the changes cost them all of $50,000 for this entire assembly line. And it was things as basic as, you know, if we stood on wood instead of concrete, by the end of the day, our legs wouldn't be hurting as much and we'd be faster. Well, you know, if, if, if I didn't have to walk all the way down there to bring something back to over here, what was the result? Productivity went up 7%. And absenteeism dropped to the lowest in all of BMW. 7% productivity growth. Phenomenal. If you were to aggregate that to the level of the factory, to the level of the company, to the level of the industry, to the level of the manufacturing sector, now we're talking about prosperity. And, but it takes a nonlinear approach. Well, but, but Jody, reason, in addition to what you just said, a lot of people criticize the concept of delaying retirement and second careers as direct competition to the already high unemployment among young people. Mm -hmm. But I think if entrepreneurs will address these emerging senior industry concept, there's a lot more job creation that's possible through creating game. services yep. for these uh, yep. people who have the highest spending power in society that will by far uh, uh, solve this problem much better than limiting people's retirement. Yeah, the, right. uh, Paul's yeah. point is, it, it, it is that, that rationale assumes there isn't economic growth. Right, yeah, uh, and another point I would just, I would just make both about, about business creation and about the continuation of, of services of people who are, who are senior. Our, our friend Laura Carstensen and her colleagues at, at Stanford have done some really interesting work around around intelligence and of course you know the operating assumption for the, we all make our own jokes I'm sure all of us on stage do about senior moments and all the rest some of that's true I don't, I don't have that. No, some, you don't have none, none of the rest of I, I do <laughs> well, but, but 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 yeah, but, but, but my but, parents talk about but <laughs> but but as it is you know if, if you know Howard Gardner's work at Harvard on multiple intelligences and all the <laughs> we, we all know about IQ and EQ and, and all the rest 
One of the things I think they've found is, is and the, again, this is not something that's talked about, is intelligence actually change, changes. So this is intuitive, right? I mean, we all think to ourselves, gee, you know, we have some greater level of wisdom and judgment, and you know, we may not remember uh, some certain facts as it, in, in as adept a way as, the we, as we did when we were 25 or 30. It's, it's demonstrable. So the truth of the matter is, is that marrying the woman who came back to your business with some younger worker makes you a better business. I, I, think, I think that and then getting a job that she could, that she could do and that right. she has the flexibility to continue to do that, that gray area of, of leisure time and at the same time be able to work. But I don't think there's any question coming back as a mentor and demonstrating, you know, even if it isn't the skill, but demonstrating this work-life balance issue around having a life that is frankly more fulfilling, which may cause that employee to stick around longer because at the end of the day, they would say, I want to work for a company that has these sorts of, of uh, programs for its employees, regardless of the situation. Yeah. Right, it, and it, it but, is, but it requires some progressive thinking on the part of the institution. incredibly progressive. Yep. It is right. the case that the, the companies that look at its aging workforce as a positive, optimistic opportunity will win the competitive this race in the 21st century. And it's because of the things we've been talking about. But again, to emphasize, this is as much about these low birth rates as it is about living longer. If it were just about living longer, you would have a different set of questions and a different set of challenges. But it's because of the low birth rates that during the course of the 21st century, and we're already beginning to see it, you simply don't have, particularly in some of the European countries, Singapore, which of course is a small country. It's only got a few million people. But the, on your point about what you've done inside the firm, Singapore actually now has a program where they're providing incentives for people to come back to work because they don't have enough young people to fill the jobs. Right. Now, that may seem odd to us in the context of this financial recession that we've been through, but it, it, it's a, I would suggest that this financial recession we're currently in and struggling very desperately to get out of um, is masking this basic structural issue that we really have to address. And it's to treat this, what we call an aging population, as an economic opportunity. The point that I've, I remember talking to a reporter, having to be from the New York Times, and you know we were sort of going back and forth and she wasn't quite, and I said, well, think about the women's movement. And think about the number of people around the world who have contributed to trillions of dollars in growth because they're now economically active right. that, is, that wasn't thought to be the case as, early, as, as recently as 30 or 40 years ago. Right. So that's the way we can now look at this new demographic of 60 to 90. You are going to make a point? Yeah, I mean, I, I just reflect back on, on this, this workforce. We all want to have the choice, and I talked about the happy returns. But if you look at an eBRI study, and this is, this, is the, this is the hard part, and this is where the skilled part comes in. If you look at the eBRI study over the course of the last uh, 10 years that they've run it, the average person who retires, who is now in retirement, 50% of them retired sooner than they thought they were going to retire for one of three reasons, their health, their spouse's health, or their skills were no longer needed. What we've got to be able to figure out is how to improve the healthiness going into retirement, and that doesn't start at retirement. That, that's part of the wellness programs, getting them to that point so they, they can make that decision. And then the third point is the retraining, committing to retraining programs, or if they do have a capacity constraint relative to what the job now requires going forward, there are plenty of other jobs for that person to pursue can I come and be able Dan? to step them back. Can please. I come in on, Dan, on Dan, Dan's point? So I'm so glad you raised particularly point, point three. So uh, from time to time, we've had, we've had some university presidents floating around the, around the conference this, this week. And, and when I have the opportunity, one of the discussions I have with them is, so you have 24-7, 365 investments in, phys in physical plant, technology, infrastructure, hum human capital, why in the, and maybe you have a little mini continuing education program, or maybe if you're imaginative, you're starting a MOOC, but who in the world says that serious education should be, should be confined to an 18 to 28 year old gap? I went back to college at, at 58, was it 58, so it was 58, uh, and I gotta tell you, I got, a, I got a whole lot more out of it than I, than I did, it, did it at 18. So, so uh, with this additional time frame, and again, 
with Hasi's point about not just physical exercise, but intellectual engagement being a good, a good thing, not just for you, but for society. It reduces, Mike, the, some, it doesn't cure the disease. But they, it, they can't but it, see that. But, it, but it, this, this, is the, this, is, this is the Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's yeah. cases. If it, if it just simply, simply defers the problem a bit, that's yeah. massive savings. So, so, the, so my point is, my point is, educational institutions should start thinking of yeah. this. And part of the answer is demographic as an asset as well. Part of the answer is go to slide 42, which is my hypothesis. You can disagree with this, but slide 42 is a kind of nostalgic slide. And even with all the changes we've had, I would suggest <clears> that we still have a kind of psychology, sociology, and culture that is steeped in an earlier time. And at, at the core of it, we have to profoundly change this culture. I don't know how to do that. But, but that is at the core. Look, you've got the World Health Organization, which in many ways is at the cutting edge of this new paradigm, and they still have retirement at 62. Uh, Alex Kalachi, who many of you know, is kicked out of his job at, six, at 62. And he's now running, the world, creating, running around the world creating age-friendly cities. But he couldn't stay in Geneva. Yeah, well, Joel Kurtzman and I joke about, you know, how, how Jack Welch was pushed out at, at 62 or whatever, and so he goes to Clayton Dubolier and makes billions for them. Uh, I just, we have a few minutes uh, left, and I, and I do want to just give an opportunity to, to the audience to ask uh, one or two questions. So if there are any Somebody's got to grab, grab a mic so we can get it on tape. Yeah, can we get a, a mic down here? We got one back there. Thank you. First of all, what type of diet do you think is the ultimate for longevity? So I guess I'll take that one. Uh, what makes you think so, we so couldn't the, have an answer the for that short one? Answer, <laughs> so, so the answer is not pizza? Uh, the, the short New York answer pizza. is anything that. except what yeah. Americans eat. <laughs> but uh, I think there's uh, some very good alternatives out there. I'm a big believer that there's not one diet that's right for everyone. Uh, the Mediterranean diet has recently been proven scientifically to be beneficial relative to a doctor-recommended low-fat diet. I think that clearly red meat is bad for you. As much fruits and vegetables are good for you. Maintaining an ideal weight uh, is good for you. And exercising along with diet, both mentally and physically, is important. Elizabeth? Can we get a mic down right. here in the front row? Right here in front of you. Um, hello, my name is Elizabeth Amini. I'm the CEO of Anti-Aging Games. You can pretty easily see a third career track for people who are older who don't need as much money, where they work part-time mostly for benefits and for just being productive. And you can see a day where insurance actually covers prevention, preventative services. But how do we get, like, when you try to get a preventative test today, they'll just say insurance doesn't cover it. So how do we get to, from this businesses should and in, insurance should to an actual, from like awareness and information to actual implementation and action? So I, we have a project underway. I think you start with a kind of philosophy and a political position. I'll call it a political position in a, in a broad sense. And we actually have a project underway, the Global Coalition on Aging with the World Economic Forum um, on a set of Business, business principles for population aging. And it's a set of seven principles that are, you know, very simple and direct around caregiving, around uh, encouraging, uh, you know, lifelong learning, around wellness, the kind of things. You, but if you can get companies to start signing on to these and your CEO is saying yes to that, and we will start making these available uh, soon, I think you begin to build a movement. Think the environment. You know, people sort of signed on to the sustainable development agenda and didn't exactly know how they were going to execute. So I think we have to start at the kind of political level and get people to kind of sign on to things and not force them to sign on to something that their general counsel will tell them they can't do. You must have retirement at, you know, such and such. I, I want to jump, jump in. So, so Elizabeth, you know, hearkening back to Hasi's point, 